Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first low-code, no-code developer day. I'm Dave Rubenstein, conference chairman and editor-in-chief of SD Times, and I'm here to tell you that we have cooked up quite a program for you designed to expand your knowledge of low-code and no-code application development. Before we get started, I'd just like to send a hearty thank you to our sponsors, OutSystems, one of the leading providers of no-code solutions, and Infragistics, uh, makers of the Indigo Design low-code design platform. You'll be hearing from them uh, during the conference with the sessions that they have, and you can learn more about them by visiting their booths in our exhibit hall. Like any conference, virtual or otherwise, you'll have the ability to chat with your peers and fellow attendees, and our speakers will be joining in the sessions to uh, keep the, the discussions going and to answer any questions that you may have. So to help you navigate through our platform so you can get the most out of our event today, here's Jacob Lukowitz from our technical team to explain things. We want to thank you for joining us today. As you've just heard, we have a lot of great sessions coming up. But before we start, here's all you need to know to navigate the site so that you can get the most out of today's experience. When you entered the event, you entered into the main lobby with a number of options on the left dashboard. Be sure to click the Sessions tab to see the entire schedule of videos for the day. Look for which breakout session is live now and click on the Join button, and you're in. Our speakers will be available during the conference to answer any questions you may have about their session. You can chat with them and other attendees in the General Sessions chat on the right side of your screen. Once the current video is finishing up, you'll see the option to join the next session pop up under your video window. And if you're in full screen mode, you'll have to exit out to see this join button. When joining a session from the main sessions tab, you'll see the current live now session pop up towards the top. Want to jump in on a previous session to join in on the chat with the speakers and fellow attendees? Just toggle the show past sessions button and hit view recording. Also, be sure to visit the expo hall, which you can find on your left hand navigation menu to learn more about our sponsors and gain access to valuable resources. As an attendee, you will gain points by visiting booths and downloading resources. At the end of the day, the attendee that gets the most points will win a $100 American Express gift card. A leaderboard has been set up in the lobby of the event so you can see how many points you have and compete with other attendees. Good luck. If at any point you have any questions on how to navigate the site, feel free to ask a question on any chat tab to the right and one of our moderators will be able to promptly guide you. Also, be sure to view today's event on your Google Chrome browser for the best viewing experience. With that, I'll throw it back to Dave. Thanks, Jacob. Great job. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We know you have a lot of options for education, and we're so thankful and grateful that you chose to be with us here today. What you'll learn will help you graduate in your development uh, skills as far as low code and no code are concerned. And now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Cindy Van Epps, who will give our keynote today, which is called Friends in Low-Code Places. So Cindy, take it away. And folks, we hope you have a great day. Hello and welcome. When did you see your first no-code automation builder? For me, it was in 1980, that's right, 41 years ago, fresh out of college, gone to work at Johnson Space Center in space shuttle flight design as a software developer. Now, while I was there, an engineer called us over to a research lab, excited to show us a simulation builder that he had prototyped. This is a representation of what he had, the different modules of a spacecraft that then you could pull together, assemble together, push a button and say, create a simulation. And he showed us that and it was incredible, hard to believe, especially because in contrast, the code that I was building at the time was written in assembly language. This is a simple example of assembly language just for adding two numbers together. And I had to code with a hexadecimal calculator in my hand because the numbers all had to be converted to hex. So there's been a great transformation in technologies, certainly across my career, but underlying that, people are basically the same. So I'm going to show you a few anecdotes and talk about the people side of no-code, low-code development. 
Here's one key thing I learned. Um, I was using model-based systems engineering, which I've done for all of my career, and this is an example of a sequence diagram. The sequence diagram shows how the components within the system interact to support some scenario. In this case, it's supporting two variations on the same scenario. So I was excited that I built an extension to the modeling tool so that it could generate test cases from the sequence diagrams, even with all the alternative flows and logic. So I ran over to the lead of the testing team and showed her what we could do, and her response surprised me. She said, you're trying to put the testers out of business. What? No, no, I'm trying to automate the tedious tasks so that they can move on to the more interesting, uh, challenging tasks of testing. In a similar experience, a few years later in front of a big group of Java developers at a large insurance company, um, pattern-based uh, development was the hot ticket. So I showed them, look, here's a model of the model view controller pattern and all you have to do is go in and add a little bit of the business logic into this model and voila, you can generate executable code from it. Isn't that great? What was their response? So you don't need Java developers anymore? No, 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 not at all. That's not what this is about. This is not what the automation is about. And you may be saying, yeah, but low code, no code is about the citizen developer. Yes, I acknowledge that, and I agree with this uh, definition that I got from Gartner about the citizen developer, and I'll use this throughout the presentation. They are business technologists who've not earned a degree in software development, but they understand the business side, and we are equipping them with tools to be able to automate some of the business function that they would need. So why would IT be offended or threatened by you starting a citizen developer program? Well, it's all about how you present it, right? If you say, well, you know, IT is just not getting us what we need, it's too slow, it's, we're low priority, we don't know what they're doing, so we're going to go deputize some new application developers, and they don't have to have all those fancy degrees, and they're not, you know, so overpaid as you guys are. That's the wrong way to build a collaboration. If you take that approach, you are going to get a backlash that you can't control. So our first takeaway is to be sensitive to who you might threaten or offend and collaborate with them in instead. Acknowledge the highly skilled, trained, uh, knowledgeable, building very sophisticated systems, people that you have in IT, and reassure them that this is in no way intended to replace them now or in the future. Now let's look at that evolution in technology that I talked about. Yes, assembly language, very much based in what is the language that the computer understands. I had to learn to speak in that language. Then we moved to third generation languages like Java and C++, but they still had the language of software development, the, the looping constructs, the switching constructs, all of those things that uh, we learned in college, data structures. And then we moved to tools like Excel. And some people would say those are the first no-code, low-code environments. And they've been extremely effective at, at letting us build solutions using the Excel interface and the Excel commands. Now we have no code, low code, which I'm showing an example of UCalc, which is something that I build value calculators with. And I'm going to show you that in a little more detail. But the key thing is that these no code, low code environments are written in language that people understand. Math is something that my seven-year-old granddaughter understands. A graphical user interface with these widgets are something people will see and understand. And that's the power in them. So let's talk, though, about the other fronts on which we evolve, not just the technology of how we tell the computer what we want it to do. Now here I show you four other fronts, because it's really important to understand how these considerations fit into no-code, low-code development. Yes, we are building enormously more sophisticated systems with um, software embedded, software driven, 
Um, there are very few systems that we still use that aren't at least being considered for some sort of automation. And part of what's helped uh, evolve the demand is the accessibility, the availability. Early on, it was just the, the engineer who had a solution on her desktop. And we've moved on a continuum of easier access, easier deployment of our solutions for access to a broader set of users. Arguably, smartphones have made an app user out of almost everyone in the world. So this idea of applications and automation is not only comfortable, it's expected. So automation, my third line, is an advancement that, an evolution that has helped us address this higher demand, the demand to build more sophisticated systems, all the way into um, now manufacturing. In concert with that, how we build them, what are the success patterns for the steps we take in getting from an idea to something of value? That's the process line here. And there's been a great deal of steps along that evolution, and those steps have helped move us from the single coding cowboy hero mode that we started in all the way to teams and teams of teams and even collaborating enterprises. So we need to take those into consideration as we consider low code, no code, because there will be continual evolution. And let me just start with a quick tour through UCALC, my new no-code development team, because I build value calculators, and I'll show you some of those. But here is the beauty of this no-code solution, as is the others. This has 10, 10 controls that I can drag and drop onto a page. Behind the scenes, and those are my parameters for my calculators, and then behind the scenes, the tool does the algebra. It makes variables out of those, and then I take those variables and I do the simple math. I create a mathematical formula. It's extremely intuitive, and in fact, this uh, calculator I, I built just for this keynote to show you how you can add two numbers, uh, it took me less than two minutes to build that. Super, super simple. And it's not just the simple, simple calculator. Here are two examples of my value calculators. Um, I use these calculators to help people quantify the value of adhering to certain practices. So these are calculators that I've built with UCALP. I showed you the interface, super easy, drag and drop. Where do I spend most of my time building these solutions? I spend most of my time designing what are the parameters? How would I describe them? What are the ranges, the defaults? What are the formulas? What will resonate with the users of my calculators? And in fact, some of my more sophisticated calculators I design in Excel so that I can also have test data and test my uh, formulas there. But that's my no-code solution. And I'm leading up to this idea that if we have um, citizen developers, these citizen developers are business technologists, right? They have a day job. <laughs> they know a business domain very, very well. And that's part of the cognitive load. That is the information that they have to keep in their brain at any given time. So if we are going to take those business technologists and make them citizen developers, we have to think about what is the cognitive load now we are piling on? This no-code, low-code tool, how many parameters, how intuitive is it? Do I have easy access to, to help systems and examples? Um, because I've seen a gamut. UCALC is very, very simple, and I've seen the gamut to other no-code, low-code solutions where you have to go through training to really understand the under-the-hood language of uh, the no-code system. So think about those things that we are adding on in cognitive load, and also governance. We'll talk about governance a little bit later. So the key takeaway here is examine what the person creating the automation knows and needs to learn. Now, in addition to cognitive load, there's something I call communication and collaboration load. And this, for you, is going to be a function of how many users is my automation supporting? How will I gain inputs from them, feedback from them? Do I need to train them? 
What governance will I be subjected to? Uh, do I have to report to someone who's providing funding, uh, my manager, other stakeholders? So this is also really a, a time commitment and an impact on the no-code, low-code developer. And so just creating the solution, man, that's the part that gets us all excited. It's what I've always loved about software development. And then we have these other things around it that are just part of the nature of building automation that others will use as well. The other thing that I have learned is you will be a victim of your success. By that I mean you build something great, you'll know it's successful if your feedback is yes, and can it do this, and can it do that? Could we connect it up to this other system that's giving me this so that I don't have to input the parameters? And this is how the world has become very connected. Digital transformation is all about connecting the data across all of these systems to support delivery of value. So think about the additional systems and the impact, um, not necessarily when you first build your automation, but your strategy about the scope of your automation and how you are going to allow its connections and features to expand. And that leads us to our third takeaway. Think in advance about which other people and systems are involved in the definition use testing and who's going to maintain this thing once that you've put it out there in the wild. Now, the next topic is one near and dear to my heart. Any of you heard of Salesforce? Of course you have. It's a great no-code, low-code uh, platform. And in fact, this Forbes article just reinforces that. So it's, it's easy for users without any technical skills to add a new data field. Great, great. I had the opportunity last year to participate in a Salesforce implementation across a very large uh, military defense contractor. And this is what the plan of attack was. Now, let me, so what happened is the, the, the company I was working with had contracted out to a system integrator to build this uh, Salesforce implementation. And this was their plan. Now, uh, although I was an agile coach <laughs> on this project, ironically, the contract had already been signed, sealed, and delivered, and the, the system integrator was in no way required to use agile practices. But you will say, oh, that's a pretty good plan, because look there. Ooh, yeah, there's some sprints. There's sprint demos. There's user stories. Wow. That looks agile to me. <laughs> well, yes, and we could have done so much better. Those kinds of things I call sprinkling of agile fairy dust because they were missing some really key elements of value from agile. Now, every time I highlighted those, uh, the system integrator used that contract as their defense for not having to do anything uh, other than what they had already stated they would do. <clears throat> so. Like any good Agile team member, <laughs> I rolled up my sleeves and said, okay, I'm telling you we can do better. I'm going to show you what that means. And so instead of hanging our hope of quality on system demos and some unit testing done by the system integrator, uh, and the unit testing was suspect, the system demos could easily hide things. They wouldn't it wouldn't show regression defects. So I said, I'm going to write some test cases every sprint. I'm going to write test cases for the work that is built and demonstrated in those sprints. And I did. And each sprint, I uncovered questions because it was another set of eyes. And I uncovered questions and issues and headed off some major, major defects that would have shown up way late in the process. I also created an extensive set of test suites that the 100 UAT, user acceptance test testers, used. They wouldn't have had time in their two-week iteration to figure it all out and write them. So I created those test suites that got them up and running um, easily in significant time. And then I also collaborated with the training developer and said, hey, look, you know, it's collective ownership, a key aspect of Agile. I said, hey, look, we could take these test cases and feed them right into your training material 
give you a big old head start. So what I'm saying here is that just because you can build something faster with no code solution doesn't mean that you're abdicated from getting value from some of our success patterns like lean and agile. Now, yes, that learning these and learning how to apply them effectively would add to the cognitive load of your uh, citizen developers, but I believe it's definitely worth the investment um, not only lean, agile practices, uh, design thinking, and test-driven development. So that's our fourth takeaway. Let's move on to the fifth and last one. Governance. You know, there's rarely an application that we uh, have built that we don't need some kind of governance. And in fact, if your hardcore application developer friends are giving you a little smirk like this, or the stink eye, when you say, yeah, I'm building applications now. <laughs> they are thinking, if not saying, you just have no idea of the governance required by our organization to develop and deliver anything. And that's where the rub comes in, is because just like with Agile practices, governance needs to be applied in a way that's practical and makes sense for the kind of solution that you're building. Now, we talked earlier about people who might be offended or threatened by what you're doing. I have also seen in organizations that the that people in charge of the process, here's our standard process, here's our governance, I'm the quality assurance team. They too will be threatened or at least very concerned about the fact that you are building applications and you haven't consulted with them about what is required on the governance front. People may try to weaponize governance against you. Not you personally, but it's something new. They don't like change. The idea of the business side building their own applications is going to blow their minds. And just along those lines, the language. I, uh, I suggest you try a new language. Don't say, oh, we're going to get a bunch of application developers over here in the business. Change the wording. Call it automation builders. Something different, right, to distinguish it from the governance process and whatever else is in place in your company. So this is our last takeaway. Be explicit from the beginning about the governance needed. I once built a little automation piece on top of a portfolio management tool. It took two weeks to build it. It took me three months to jump through the hoops of the approval processes in the company. I wish I had known from the outset. I wish I had had more strength of character to say, this absolutely does not make sense. I wish I'd had a value calculator that could show them the amount of money that was being spent foolishly with an overburdened governance process. So this is my fifth takeaway on the people issues or people considerations related to no code, low code development. And here they are summarized. I wish we were in an interactive session where you could make some observations, collaborate with me, help me understand your frame of reference on these things, but I hope that you will reach out to me. I'm happy to have those conversations, either through email, on LinkedIn, um, and I wish you the best of luck with moving into a new realm of the kind of automation building that is going to move us forward in many of those fronts in our evolution. So with that, I thank you, and I thank uh, Software Development Times and uh, David Rubenstein for this opportunity. Enjoy your developer day.